Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Not at the Museum Thursday Nights. I'm Sylvia. I'm the assistant curator here with the Niagara Falls History Museum. Uh, as usual, we're going to begin our evening with a land acknowledgement. The region of Niagara of Ontario is located on the shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Chinatown people. The Chinatown people have called this land their home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing this land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. So let's get to tonight. Our speaker this evening is Renee Selhani. She is an associate professor of history at Brock University who researches the history of drink, drinkers, and the trouble they got into, and particularly during the era of the War of 1812. Tonight, she will be discussing a hot, hellish, and terrible liquor rum and the taste of the empire in colonial North America. Uh, as you will notice in Zoom, we do have a Q&A feature. So if at any point you have any questions for Renee, please feel free to type it in there. And at the end of her presentation, we'll be answering those questions. For anyone joining us on Facebook, it's the same idea. You can write your questions or comments uh, in the comment section and we'll get to it uh, at the end of Renee's presentation. So uh, I won't take up any more of your time. Let's get this evening started. So I'm gonna hand it over to Renee. Thank you very much, Sylvia. I am just gonna go ahead here and share my screen before I do anything. We practice this, so this should work fairly well. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you all very much for attending this evening. I'm very pleased that we were able to put this together and reschedule from July. I'm going to start my discussion of rum this evening, and I hope some of you, because we're doing this at home, I hope some of you uh, have a little bit of rum with you maybe, uh, but I am going to start with something a little bit unseasonable. For those of you who celebrate Christmas, you may find the following picture fairly familiar. This is an illustration from Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, featuring the Christmas ball hosted by Mr. Fezziwig, which Ebenezer Scrooge attends as a young man, then revisits with the ghost of Christmas past. The people at this party and in non-fiction Christmas parties all across England and throughout North America until at least the late 1800s would have been drinking punch. Most of it in North America and a great deal of it in England would have been made with rum. Rum punch was a holiday staple. It was one of Dickens's favorite drinks. He preferred it with a bit of cognac made with black tea. In North America and in the colonies that would become Canada and the United States, rum punch was drunk all year round, not just at Christmas, and it was probably the most popular alcoholic beverage in colonial America until sometime in the 19th century. And punch is full of all kinds of inter interesting contradictions. For example, the bowls from which it was consumed could be made of very fine or very rough materials. You might have a simple ceramic bowl and you might have something that was far more elaborate and expensive like Paul Revere's Silver Liberty Bowl, which you can see in the top left-hand corner. I don't know if you can see my mouse. This particular bowl, which is just shy of one foot in diameter, is made of silver and it was crafted to honor the rebellious legislators of the Massachusetts colony in 1767 who refused to abide by the Townsend Act. The Townsend Acts were the ones that taxed tea, among other things, and sort of sparked the, uh, the revolution. The variety of the materials and the types of punch bowls that we see tell us that everyone, rich and poor, drank punch. Even pirates, who are normally famous for swilling rum straight from the bottle without a chaser, were known to favor punches when they were taking, uh, taking a break from sacking things. So punch bowls, like these ones, suggest that it was consumed across the emotional spectrum from those at Christmas parties to those you see in the lower left hand who were seeking company for their misery, uh, to those who were plotting to overthrow the king or to pillage an unsuspecting village at dawn. We know that both men and women drank it, as you can see by the sketch by Thomas Rowlandson, which is in the lower right, that's from the late 18th century. Sometimes rum punch was a very respectable drink as it was during Mr. Fezziwig's ball. Sometimes it was very politically charged, but it was almost always a very communal drink and a very social drink. It was something that people drank in company. And while it could be ladled out in a very genteel way into cups, some people would often drink it directly from the bowl. 
as the bowl was passed around the table. As you might imagine, it was thereby consumed in great quantities, and this is not recommended during a pandemic. So a simple thing like a punch bowl can tell us a lot about something simple like hygiene in colonial North America, but it can also tell us a lot about taste. Consider the basic recipe. This is a very basic recipe for rum punch in the 1700s. So the term punch probably comes from the Hindustani word meaning five, which refers to the, the number of basic ingredients that you would need to make punch. So the base of it was water. Depending on how much you liked your company, you could use a whole lot of water or just a little bit of water and make a much stronger punch. The next main ingredient after that, sometimes half and half, sometimes one part spirits to one part water um, would be rum, obviously. In England and in some places in North America, punch was frequently made with brandy, but the use of rum was increasingly popular by the middle of the 18th century. The next thing you add would be citrus. You would need lemons or limes, particularly, and depending again on your taste, you could pick whichever you liked. You would also usually add sugar. And if your guest palates preferred something really sweet, you could add a lot of sugar. You could add molasses if you didn't have sugar. Sometimes people added fruits as well, really sweet fruits like pineapple. And finally, there would be spices. From Sri, Sri Lanka, there was cinnamon. From Indonesia, you would have cloves and nutmeg, which was the most popular. And from Mexico, you would have allspice. And all of these things could go into your punch depending on your taste and what you preferred. Simply looking at the recipe, you can see here the scope of imperial trade. With the exception of the water, all of these ingredients for everybody in Britain and for most of North America were imported. And so to drink punch, obviously, sometimes to excess, meant that you needed extensive trade networks, you needed imperial control, you needed good shipping. So punch tells us a lot about globalization. But as Frederick Smith and Karen Harvey have pointed out, it's not just about the globalization of trade, it's also about the globalization of taste. All of these far-flung colonies were changing how food and drink tasted in, by the, among the colonizers. Sugar is a big part of this. Now, I don't want to make the case here that alcohol was responsible for the spread of European empires, but the beginnings of English colonization in North and South America were fueled in part by the search for what might become a domestic source of booze or a, a source that one that the empire could control. So travelers throughout North America frequently wrote home about the possibilities for growing and harvesting grapes for wine and brandy production, for example. Very early on in the Chesapeake, Viticulture was attempted, it wasn't very successful. But the urge was there because in England, consumers were reliant on foreign alcohol, port wines, Madeira, French brandy. And this reliance was expensive and it was irritating and it was often sometimes quite unreliable. So when there was war with France, which is all the time, um, or when there were bad harvests, the supply of Englishmen's favorite libation could dry up and the prices would rise. So the search for domestic sources of alcohol was important for people in England. Um, and it was also very important, this, this urge was shared by colonists in the Americas as well. In the early days of European settlement, it wasn't easy to get supplies from overseas and imported alcohol was expensive and it was often quite rare. Some colonists had simple distilling technology right in their own kitchens. They're sometimes called lembics or alembics. This one is a really, fancy copper version that runs about $1,200 US if you want one. Uh, these contraptions were used to distill out anything that was sweet and fermentable. So honey, pears um, in the southern part of the continent, peaches. But the most commonly produced domestic alcohols in the colonies were beer and cider, most of which in North America were made by wives and mothers, and all of which was considered essential to a healthy diet. So all you required for these were grains or apples. Apples were very plentiful in the North. And of course, you also required patience, which I think is probably why the women did it. In some places, I'm kidding. In some places, perhaps as early as 1640 around Rhode Island, local uh, grist from local mills, was, uh, grain mills was also mashed and distilled into whiskey. In Upper Canada, including in the Niagara region, Davin de Kergamo writes about this, by the 1800s, German and Dutch settlers had introduced rye into the mix for this whiskey mash. Uh, it's something that they were used to for their home countries and uh, local people really liked it because the Canadian rye whiskey, that's how it's invented, I guess, uh, has a spicier flavor. 
But these aren't always reliable sources of drink either. Cider, if you drank it too early, could produce horrible gastric issues. If you left it too long, it became vinegar. In warmer colonies and in warmer seasons, it spoiled fairly quickly. The grains that were used for beer were also a significant source of food. And so when harvests were thin or if crops failed, or if you were going to war and you knew that the, the demands for bread would be high, beer was off the table. So, so rum presented a fairly palatable solution to these problems. Molasses, which was its main ingredient, was more or less a waste product of sugar production. I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment. At best, molasses was an inexpensive sweetener, flavoring. Some people considered it medicinal, but it wasn't really food. So it doesn't face the same kinds of restrictions that are placed on the fermenting and the distillation of grains. And North American colonists a little bit later in British North America began importing molasses in the late 1600s to distill at home, also to, to use in like food, but also to distill. It was cheaper initially to import molasses than it was to purchase rum, especially when the stuff was purchased from the French sugar islands. There is a distinct possibility, in fact, that conflict between imperial powers facilitated the distillation of rum in North America. John McCusker, who wrote a wonderful book many years ago now called Rum and the American Revolution, he suggested, for example, that King William's War, which was fought uh, in the late 1680s to the late 1690s, opened the door for colonial rum distilling because the crown prohibited imports of French brandy during that conflict. So over time, rum gets increasingly cheaper uh, and it fills a niche to some extent. It has a bigger kick than cider uh, and it doesn't spoil and it was more reliable than whiskey. As Amy Stewart notes though, rum might never have happened at all. And if you have a phobia about bugs, maybe turn away for a moment. It, rum might not happen at all, <laughs> at all, if not for a creature something like this, the Physomerius brasipes. I have no idea if I'm saying that properly. Uh, the sweet potato bug or the sweet potato beetle. So among the first British colonies in the West Indies, the first sugar islands, as they get called, were Barbados and Jamaica. So for those of you who are geographically challenged like me, Jamaica has the red pin on it on the left, and Barbados is way down here over on the right. Um, these aren't the only islands that the British claim, but they're important ones uh, for us this evening. Initially, these were colonized and settled by the British to act as raiding stations to harass ships from other European nations who were trying to uh, trade in the area. But the British very quickly learned that the soil on these islands, they probably learned this from native people, was very useful for the cultivation of tobacco, which was one of the first crops that they planted there, and sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes, which uh, they're not actually potatoes, they're more closely related to morning glories. These are native to Central America, but they eventually get planted everywhere. And, but, and one of the earliest alcoholic drinks that we know of was made from sweet potatoes. It was called mabi, and it was a, a fermented sweet potato mixed with water and lemon and sugar. So it's almost like a punch, but maybe closer to a small beer. The drink was popular for almost a century, but then the potato crops get wiped out by an infestation of sweet potato beetles, and sugarcane emerges as the near exclusive crop grown on these islands. In the mid 1600s, Barbados, as one example, is almost entirely deforested and given over to the growing of sugarcane and the building of plantations for extracting sugar. Sugarcane was cultivated with the same kind of passion that went into the cultivation of grapes for winemaking. And sugar, which you would, would be sold in solid cones, like what you see in the bottom right hand corner there, was one of the commodities uh, like tea and cacao that drove imperial commerce and the early process of globalization. There was an insatiable appetite in Europe and North America for sugar. The production of sugar was incredibly labor intensive. First, the soil had to be tilled and prepared and then the canes planted, which is what you see happening in the top left hand corner. And all of this work was done in hot tropical sun. The cane fields, when they are full grown, are incredibly dangerous. They're full of rats, snakes, uh, centipedes, all kinds of bugs. And the harvesting not only stirred up and irritated these creatures, but it was done by hand with machetes, which is what you see in the lower right. It was an extremely physical, unpleasant process. And the sugar canes were then crushed to extract the juices and the juices are then boiled down in these massive scalding hot kettles, as you see depicted here. 
The waste product of the boiling process, sometimes called the skimmings, was the first liquid ever fermented from sugarcane. When the fermented skimmings were distilled, they made rum. Up until the early 17th century, in fact, molasses wasn't necessarily used for the production of rum. That stuff for a lot of sugar producers, for a lot of the planters was actually further boiled down to produce low grade sugar, or it was just sold as molasses. As rum becomes more popular though, and molasses becomes more plentiful, particularly after the French get invested in the sugar islands, molasses is the stuff that gets used to make rum, but the earliest beverages was the product of the skimmings, which you can kind of see, it's a, not a very great picture, but that sort of scummy stuff on the top is what was used. Overall, this is a fairly ingenious industry. You're using a waste product to make a desirable commodity for pirates and sailors and everybody else to put into their eggnog. Importantly, as hopefully though, it becomes clear at looking at these pictures at the, of the process in Antigua, enslaved people were central to this entire process. By the late 1600s, English ships, which are my focus, the English were not the only people who were slavers, English ships by the late 1600s had purchased and transported hundreds of thousands of African captives to work the sugar plantations. These enslaved people are the planters, the harvesters, the producers of sugars, the ones who are um, dealing with the heat and the machetes and the centipedes and the rats. These people are the distillers and the bottlers of rum. In fact, there's a few historians, including Frederick Smith, who make the case that African enslaved people are also the ones who figured out how to ferment the skimmings required to make rum in the first place. And we believe this in part because one of the first written mentions of what looks like rum was published around 1550. And it details an account of the tour of the islands of Jamaica and Barbados between about 1511 and 1520. And the author notes that African slaves were fermenting the juices of sugarcane for their own consumption. This isn't anthropologically exciting. Many of the enslaved people were taken from societies that produced a wide variety of fermented alcoholic drinks. So just like Europeans seeking sources of alcohol wherever they land, it's, it's normal, it's natural that the uh, enslaved people would do so as well, that the Africans would as well. So for a very long time, the distilled product of sugarcane lacked a standard name. Some early writers referred to it as kill devil, which is one of my favorites. Uh, and the French had variations on eau de vie de cam. Eau de vie was usually uh, associated with brandy, and it's kind of a reference to something that it was the essence of something. Rum was probably coined, most people think that this is how it was coined, after the drink was referred to as rum bullion, um, which meant great tumult. So it was to convey a word that was meant to convey the volatile effects of excessive rum consumption. By 1650, the bullion is dropped, 16, 1700, and it just becomes rum. And by 1650, as Frederick Smith notes in his uh, very excellent history of Caribbean rum, a distillery and a still house was already considered an essential part of the sugar plantation complex. So this one, for example, this is at Mount Gay, this is Mount Gay Rum in Barbados. This particular distillery was officially established in 1703, but it's actually built on the site of a pre-existing uh, distillery for the production of rum. Ironically, um, rum wasn't simply the product of slave labor and ingenuity, but rum also facilitated the trade that put these people there. Rum was the second most sought after trade item. It was sought more than guns and gunpowder for slavers on the west coast of Africa. If you wanted slaves, you needed rum. It was currency. It was something that was easily stored. It was something that improved with age. It was something that by the mid 1700s was a highly sought after trade good. And to give you a sense of the value that it had in the human slave trade, it's been estimated that um, trade ships were carrying 1.3 million gallons of spirits, most of it rum, from the Caribbean to Africa between 1680 and 1713 alone. So 1.3 million gallons per year. And those barrels were exchanged for approximately 60,000 human beings in this period. The image of the, the slaves, the interior of the slave, sh slave ship is probably familiar to some of you. Um, that's from a little bit later period, that's from 1788. So the use of rum as a kind of currency uh, applied not only in the slave trade, this was also very, a very common practice in North American colonies. As W.J. Rorabaugh and people like Sarah Meacham, among others, have argued, rum was currency in towns and villages, just like it was on the high seas. 
Um, lacking hard money and fearful of credit is how Rohrbar Ro writes, merchants turn to barter and they often bartered for and with rum. People could uh, and did pay their rent and their physician's bills with rum. Uh, the account books of merchants all over the British colonies show that rum was used as payment. Um, along with chickens and bacon, which seem to have come up a lot in the ones that I see. It's certainly well known for its use as a trade good between colonizers and North American First Nations people as well. And although I don't really speak to that this evening, I'll just note that white colonizers in North America liked rum for the same reason that the slavers did. It was cheap to produce, it was easy to transport, it was easy to store, uh, and it was also addictive and it's consumable. So there's always a demand for it. Given its role in the slave trade, it shouldn't surprise you that rum or its main ingredient, sugar, also provided fodder for the abolition movement. Some producers were rumored to boil their slaves in sugar plantations as punishment for insubordination, which is what you can see depicted here in this early 19th century cartoon. And abolitionists across England and the colonies refused to put sugar in their tea as a way to protest the way that it was manufactured. As Amy Stewart points out though, hardly any of these people would probably have refused to drink rum. The producers of other alcoholic beverages, so producers of brandy and gin, also like to spread rumors that rum producers would put the corpses of African captives in barrels of rum to enhance the flavor. These were the kinds of stories that would, they thought, hopefully stop people from purchasing rum and instead put their hard-earned shekels toward other types of spirits. Even without rumors about adulteration by corpses, Rum was not popular among English speakers in Europe for a long time. Most spirit drinkers there preferred French brandy. And in parts of the colonies, rum was considered by some people in a similar light. It was the drink of slaves or poor people, laborers, servants. And so some of the earliest recipes that we have for punch uh, from colonial highbrows at least, indicate that it should be made with brandy as it often was in England. So one of the most famous examples that I've seen is Benjamin Franklin's milk punch. You can find this recipe online. I'm more than happy to share it with people at the end if you want the, the full recipe, but be forewarned that you'll need among other things, six quarts of brandy, the rinds of 44 lemons, uh, four large nutmegs, two pounds of double refined sugar. Uh, presumably this produces a lot, of, a lot of punch because then you're also adding um, three quarts of milk, several more quarts of lemon juice. It's quite, a, quite an involved process. And while this particular punch would have been extremely agreeable to most upper class whites, rum was not. Early on in the 17th and the early 18th centuries, it was actually considered to be a bit disgusting. So in 1703, for example, Christopher Codrington the Younger, who's depicted here in his statue at Oxford, he was once the governor of Barbados. He jokingly referred, I think he was joking, he jokingly referred to rum served out to new arrivals to the island as an attempt to murder strangers as a way of welcome. And of course, there is John Ligon or Ligon, another Englishman in Barbados who described rum for the first time in 1651 and most conveniently gave it a catchy title for my talk this evening. The chief fuddling they make in the islands is rum bullion, alias kill devil. And this is made of sugar canes distilled a hot, hellish and terrible liquor. Despite early British reticence and Franklin and company's preferred punch, rum was very popular among most sort of working people, working white people in the American colonies. As early as 1699, one traveler to New England, Edward Ward described rum as the most popular of spirits. And he wrote, rum alias kill devil is, the, is much adored by the American English as the dram of brandy is by an old Billingsgate. Tis held as the comforter of their souls, the preserver of their bodies, the remover of their cares and promoter of their mirth and is a sovereign remedy against the grumblings of the guts, a kibe heel or a wounded conscience, which are epidemical distempers that afflict the country. So he gets a little stab in there for the colonists. In fact, rum was so popular uh, in, in North America that it can be called, as Williams notes, one of the first mass produced products made in North America. For a long time, through most of the 17th centuries, the early 18th centuries, Rum was probably second only to shipbuilding in the manufacturing sector of what would become the United States. And rum was certainly implicated in the creation of the United States as well. For starters, taxes on sugar and molasses were about as popular as the taxes on stamps and tea. 
1733, the British government enacted the Molasses Act, an attempt to force colonists across North America, including anybody who was in the territories that are now Canada, to buy British molasses instead of French, which was cheaper. But the act only inspired resentment and it inspired resentment among men who were gathering in taverns, drinking rum and complaining about the government. So taverns, as many historians have shown, were the places where the ideas of the revolution were bandied about and debated and refined. And to attempt something that would raise the prices at the bar was not very smart. After the revolution, John Adams, writing to his friend William Tudor, very famously said, I know not why we should blush to confess that molasses was an essential ingredient in American independence. And a big part of that was because of the, the demand for molasses for distillation. The links between the revolution and rum go even deeper than this. They go more symbolic and more ritualized. Rum was usually the drink of choice before and after fighting the British. And certainly there was a great deal of rum punch uh, drunk to celebrate independence and, or even to gussy up the courage to fight for it. So Paul Revere on his famous midnight ride in 1775 to Lexington, Massachusetts to warn that the Redcoats were coming, um, he reportedly stopped at the, the home of um, Isaac Hall in Medford, Massachusetts and had a tot of rum before he galloped onward. And well, it may seem like a foolish thing for him to do given his mission and the need for speed, it's not at all surprising to me that he would have done this. It would have been stranger that he hadn't stopped for a glass of rum because rum was believed to be a restorative. It was something that could revive flagging spirits and weakening bodies. And Isaac Hall was one of the largest distillers of rum in the United States at the time. He had produced millions of tots by the time Paul Revere arrived on his doorstep. The Revolutionary War did cut off supplies of Barbadian and Jamaican rum. Um, except in British controlled territories. And the war also curtailed the activities of domestic di distillers somewhat. But rum drinking continues apace and it's helped by smugglers. In the early part of the war, the Danish Virgin Islands, St. Croix and St. Thomas smuggled about half a million gallons of rum per year to the 13 continental colonies, mainly through ports in Connecticut. So if you liked rum, Connecticut was the place to be. And to give a sense of how popular rum was among the colonists and how unpopular the British were, consider the effect of the Revolutionary War period on British rum producers. Between 1770 and 1773, just before the war broke out, the annual average volume of exports to the 13 colonies was about 3 million gallons. Between 1783, the year the war ended, and 1787, it had dropped almost half to only 1.7 million gallons. So the domestic market had picked up, the French market had picked up. Uh, these are stats from Frederick Smith's History of Rum, and I have a reference to that at the end. It's quite excellent. So not only the war, of course, could affect supply levels and the trade in rum. In 1780, this is very topical these days, a major hurricane swept through the West Indies. They called it Hurricane San Calypso, and it was probably about a Category 5. That's what people looking at accounts of it estimated. When it reached Barbados, it was probably a Category 5, which meant that it had sustained winds of 320 kilometers per hour. It was reported that not a single tree, not a single building, house, not even the forts were left intact and standing after the storm passed. And this guy, British Admiral George Bridges Rodney, reported that the wind carried the cannons on his ship about 100 feet into the air during the storm. So the storm more or less ruined rum production. It may have killed, uh, it probably killed more than 4,000 people. And it also dealt a very serious blow, just incidentally, to the British Navy, which was vying for control of this area at the time. At least some of the empty jiggers left by these drops and imports were filled by domestic production. At the end of the 17th century, as I mentioned, there were several commercial distilleries operating, and this certainly increased throughout the 1700s. Some of the larger ones and the first ones were in Massachusetts, in Boston, and Salem. Domestic producers, however, were not initially considered to be particularly skilled uh, in comparison to the Caribbeans. Boston rum in the early 1700s was sometimes called stinky bus. And the most flattering description of Yankee rum was that it was cheap and plentiful. And I'm myself, I'm certainly inclined to believe that drinking rum straight with a water chaser, which was the favored way to consume it in later years of the 18th century, was not the most palatable method early on, even for Caribbean rums. 
before the process of distillation is refined and improved, which really happens uh, over the course of the 18th century, it's very likely that rum was hot and hellish and terrible. And one of the reasons that I suspect this is that the most popular way to consume it in North America, a uh, second, actually the second most, second only to putting in a punch with all kinds of fruits and flavorings, was something called a flip which first appears on recipe lists around 1690. So it is probably being consumed prior to 1690. So the flip is a peculiarly American continental concoction and it was popular for almost a century. It was made when you would take a big mug or a pitcher of beer about two thirds full. And in the colonial period that beer would have been fairly dark and heavy, almost like porter. And into that pitcher, Anywhere from one or two to as many as 10 ounces of rum would be mixed in depending on the size of the container uh, and, and the recipe. And then you would add sugar or molasses or some other sweet thing like perhaps dried pumpkin. And then often eggs were added. So putting eggs into a flip wasn't always required, uh, but it wasn't always required in a recipe, but doing so uh, was quite common and sometimes it ended up giving the name a different drink depending on where you were. So some people called a flip with an egg a bellow stop. Versions of the drink with eggs were also sometimes called a cali. Uh, if you heated it up it was a king's cali um, and it, it particularly in, in Newfoundland and in parts of New England a calabogus was rum, eggs, a sweetener mixed with spruce beer instead of regular beer. So it has a very piney flavor to it. But for a traditional flip whether you have eggs or not, and don't trust any modern recipe that doesn't do this, the next step would be to take a red hot poker, sometimes called a loggerhead out of your fireplace and just stick it right into the mug so that everything would heat up and foam and mix together as you see here. This is, I highly recommend this guy, the host of Townsend's on YouTube. I love his stuff. He does all kinds of reproductions from the 18th century and he's a great deal of fun. And he makes a very good flip in this video. So as you'd imagine, all of this mixing and sweetening and beering and heating with iron pokers would really change and disguise the taste of rum. So I've always thought that the flip was an indication that the rum itself wasn't very good. A flip is good, but maybe rum not so much. But as I noted, rum does become popular, even unflipped rum all over the empire. And to give you an indication of its popularity, a few statistics again from Frederick Smith. Early in the 1660s, only 4% of the value of exports shipped from Barbados was found in rum. So 4%. 30 years later, near the end of the 17th century, it was 24% of the value of total exports. And that includes 24%. The rest of the exports are things like sugar, which are, you know, that's what, that's what the island's there for. And by the 1730s, rum surpassed most alcohol imports into the British Empire, including French and Spanish and Madeira wines. I think, the, I think the number one was gin by the 1730s. So this transformation in opinion about rum actually happens fairly quickly. It happens by improved distillation techniques that improved flavors, but also by the fact that empires were defended and expanded by sailors. So transatlantic trade at its most fundamental level begins with the need to provision sailors, to feed them and to keep them healthy. And in long distance global shipping at the time, alcohol was a vital provision in this quest. For centuries, it was standard medical belief that a bracing draft of spirits was healthful. Distilled liquors were actually invented as medicines. So the burn of, of a spirit as you consume it was a big part of this. It was thought to be doing something. According to the medical thinking of the day, this meant that something was happening. Um, the, the alcohol was curing whatever ailed you. So spirits were considered by physicians to be nutritious and prophylactic, um, as the cartoonist Gilray from England captures really beautifully at the end of the 18th century in this satirical cartoon. In this case, the spirits taken in punch, we're just gonna assume they're rum because of the subject of the talk. But as Gilray's mocking here, he's mocking this belief, allegedly they could cure everything from colic, gout, and the tizic. And the tizic is a chest cough, a deep chest cough. Rum was considered to be especially useful medicinally. If it was too cold, if you were in Canada, rum would warm you up. If it was too hot, if you were in the tropics, it would help you perspire and cool off. Or sorry, if it was too cold, rum would warm you. I did say that, would warm you up. Sorry, I got a little confused there. Um, it was believed to give men um, and slaves, particularly strength and energy during periods of extreme labor. It was often advocated that uh, if your enslaved people were weakening, 
their stomachs were weak. So you'd give them some rum to strengthen them up. Uh, and it's not entirely false, although it's completely empty calories. Rum probably at the time had the caloric power of butter. It was probably the equivalent of it. And it was widely used as a restorative for adults and for children, um, for American colonists riding horseback to Lexington in the middle of the night. Everybody would take rum as a, as a restorative. It was believed to aid in digestion, to soothe the symptoms of malaria, which was extremely common in North America, including in Upper Canada. Malaria itself hadn't yet been identified, so rum was used, or sorry, rum was used for symptoms of what were called seasonal or intermittent fevers. During the War of 1812, uh, one very lucky soldier in Greenbush near Buffalo, uh, suffering from a seasonal pneumatic fever, so probably malaria, was actually bathed head to toe in rum, which sounds like an amazing therapy, frankly. Uh, William Dunlop, some of you might be familiar with him, who was a physician in Upper Canada in the early 19th century who served in the War of 1812. He found himself caught outdoors in the dead of winter in 1814, and he poured rum into his moccasins to stop them and presumably his feet from freezing. Um, and the warming effects of rum were frequently touted as a cure for frostbite. For a long time, certainly alcohol, including rum, was considered to be healthier than water. One late, uh, late 17th century missionary warned that only invalids and chickens would drink water when alcohol was available. On trade ships and naval vessels, spirits like rum were added to the water barrels to keep the water clean. And so concerns about the health and strength of sailors meant that rum rations become a standard for sailors and uh, pirates. But it didn't have to be rum. It only needed to be something distilled. In fact, before 1731, there wasn't a standard ration in the British Navy at all. What you got was dependent on availability and perhaps the captain's taste. So if he liked brandy, you might get brandy. If he was a teetotaler, you might get nothing. After 1731, however, you got rum. But again, why not something like gin, which was cheaper in the 1730s and had been invented specifically to maintain the health of sailors, or brandy, which for a long time was more popular. Why does it end up with rum? Part of it was nationalistic, imperialistic marketing. The argument that rum was preferable was frequently touted by um, people who had financial interests in the product itself. So either the planters or their investors. They would point, including uh, people in, in uh, North America. So they would point to the evidence, and I use the word very loosely here, like that reported by John Old Nixon, who was a sometimes poet, playwright, and historian. In 1708, he wrote that rum, more than any other type of spirit, spirit would actually prolong your life. So in the Sugar Islands, he wrote, it has been observed that such as drink of brandy freely do not live long, whereas rum drinkers hold it to a good old age. Later in that century, in 1770, an English apothecary and an experimental chemist named Robert Dossie, he claimed that rum contained volatile oils, that is, he put it, acted as a corrective to the noxious qualities of our alcohol. And French brandy, he said, didn't have this. And so French brandy was highly acidic and highly dangerous. And he demonstrated this claim by steeping giant slabs of meat in rum and brandy to show that the rum-soaked meat, the, those portions remained plump and soft, and the brandy-soaked ones were pitted and diseased looking. I'd like to very much like to know if you roasted them after. Part of rum's adoption as the ration was also inspired by logistics. English ships left port with booze in their hulls, but it was consumed on the trip out to the colonies. Planters and merchants in the islands and in ports in North America would then sell them rum, which was cheap and relatively easy to make for the trip home. Plantation owners, English investors uh, in, in the plantations capitalized on the growing taste for rum among sailors, and they lobbied the British crown for a monopoly on the ration. They eagerly pointed out that it would be an economic boon to the British colonies, and it would reduce the British Empire's dependence on foreign evil alcohol. In the early 18th century, legal standards for the content of the ration were introduced. It was a gallon of beer or a half a pint of rum but rum quickly becomes the choice. It doesn't spoil as easily be as beer. You could carry more of it. It was more condensed. It had a bigger kick and many sailors probably preferred it as a result. That kick of course, is what inspired this man, Admiral Edward Vernon, who was known as Old Grog because he was perpetually dressed in what was called a grogum cloak, which is basically a coat made of coarsely woven silk. 
um, it inspired him to water the rum because he was tired of the sailors getting completely blotto the minute they had the ration. And then he would squeeze in a little bit of lime juice producing grog, which kept the sailors under control and uh, presumably helped prevent scurvy. So rum was an official part of naval rations in the British Navy until 1970. You see sailors here getting their ration in 1940. Canada dropped the ration in the 1970s as well. But the US, surprisingly, given their national love for rum, was among the first to drop it. The US Navy drops the ration in the late 19th century as the result of a very powerful temperance lobby behind it. New Zealand, of all of the former uh, parts of the British Empire, is the last holdout. New Zealand sailors keep their tots until 1992. It was, of course, also part of the army ration in Canada, the United States, and throughout the empire. Sarah Meacham has discovered, though, that the preference for rum as an army ration in the British colonies before the revolution was not because of the lobbying of plantation owners. Certainly, colonial men had acquired a taste for it, um, but the rum ration was at least partly inspired by the hand wringing that went on among officers during the French and Indian War over the presence of women in the army. Traditionally, Women were the brewers of beer, spruce beer and cider, which were central to the diets of soldiers. And they did this in the army camps throughout the 17th and the 18th centuries, along with doing the laundry and making soap and things. A switching to rum, which was not made by women, reduced dependence on women brewers who, uh, as these fellows are probably lamenting over their punch bowl, represented a dire distraction for the soldiers. The introduction and the regular doling of the ration was not unproblematic, particularly when soldiers and sailors drank too much. Fights, insubordination, theft, desertion, assault, um, most of the time are connected to excessive drinking. And you can see at least part of that depicted here in a very well-known painting by John Greenwood, Sea Captains Carousing in Suriname. There's a great deal of fun happening here. There's dancing and laughter and conversation and card playing. But there's also a lot of broken crockery and broken furniture and broken people who passed out on the floor. You've also got a few people who clearly had too much. I think one of these might be covered by the little picture of me, but don't worry, it's a picture of a guy throwing up in the hallway. There's another one right there in the middle. Um, and this poor fellow, his tailcoat's about to go up in flames because he's not paying attention. And this guy is cheating at cards. So it's a mixed result, clearly, when rum bullion is being passed around the table in these gigantic bowls that everybody's drinking out of, it's really a mixed result of, of what you're gonna get. But it isn't simply military types who are prone to excessive rum tippling. By the end of the 1700s, the average white person uh, in the Chesapeake drank the equivalent of about seven ounces of rum a day. Uh, it's a lot, the seven shots of rum a day. By the 1820s, that was common throughout most of the United States, that level of intoxication. In Canada, things were hardly any more sober. For women, hard spirits like rum were probably less commonly consumed, but we have fewer piece of, pieces of evidence to figure out what women drank or how much they drank. We do know that they drank punch, of course, and Sarah Meacham estimates that for women in the southern parts of the colonies, two, part, two pints of hard cider a day would not have been uncommon by the end of the 18th century. So because I think because so much of the spirit drinking was rum drinking in the colonies because it was the most common alcohol served in taverns, uh, it was the most common alcohol purchased by merchants, the vast majority of drinks that were ordered in any tavern anywhere in the States had rum in them. It's certainly no surprise that when the temperance activists get their danders up in the 19th century, they target the demon rum. They don't target like bedeviling brandy or the gargoyle gin, they, they go after rum. When armies and navies weren't at war, excessive rum consum consumption still inspired trouble and violence on the high seas, partly because all of those sailors are now let go to find something and many of them end up as pirates. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about rum and piracy in any kind of depth tonight, but I want to end with one pirate whose relationship to rum was both intimate and in a way rather sociable. And it brings us back to where we began at the beginning of the talk uh, to a punch bowl. So one of the most iconic pirates of the 18th century was this man, Edward Teach, otherwise known as Blackbeard. He's been, I think, problematically romanticized in popular culture to some extent, most dramatically by Ian McShane in Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, 
Teach was an Englishman and he was a particularly vicious character. He was well known for his drunkenness along with his enormous capacity for cruelty. He was described by one contemporary as the embodiment of impregnable wickedness, a nightmarish villain, villain so lacking in any human kindness that no crime was above him. He was fearsome looking by most accounts of people who saw him. He dressed his beard with scarlet ribbons for battle and he would set burning matches behind his ears to light up his face and his eyes and terrify his enemies and his targets. You can kind of see that a little bit in this illustration. I think that's what this curly smoke is supposed to represent. Uh, and Teach drank a lot, as did his men. He kept the ship's log, of course, and from it, through Daniel Defoe's General History of Pirates, which was uh, published in the 18th century, it's clear that one thing popular culture has gotten correct is that rum was central to piracy. In fact, it seems to have been something that the pirates needed to get through a day's work. So this is from Teach's journal, or so Defoe says it is. Such a day, rum all out, our company somewhat sober, a damned confusion among us, rogues a-plotting, great talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize, such a day took one with a great deal of liquor on board, so kept the company hot, damned hot, then all things went well again. So Teach and his ship are eventually captured by a Royal Navy ship and crew captained by Lieutenant Robert Maynard. After he takes a very healthy swig of rum, Blackbeard dies defiant. He was reportedly shot five times. He was stabbed or slashed at least 20 times before he finally gave up the ghost. He was, his body was beheaded after death. Uh, the corpse was tossed into the ocean and his head allegedly was displayed on the bowsprit of Maynard's ship as proof that he was dead and so that Maynard and his crew could collect the bounty. Um, Blackbeard's skull, I think this is apocryphal, but this is the perfect way to round things out this evening. His skull continued in service as a receptacle for rum. According to legend, and at least a few rather respectable antiquarians, Blackbeard's skull was used as a large punch bowl called the infant, which until about 1803 was here at the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg, Connecticut, where it is now, I have no idea. It was supposedly encased in silver, and it was engraved with the words death to Spotswood. Spotswood was the governor of Virginia who um, issued the warrant and the reward for Blackbeard's capture. So we've come full circle back to punch in a fashion. Uh, I'm sure I'd rather drink my punch from Revere's Liberty Bowl, preferably at a Christmas party with Mr. Fezziwig or one of these fellows. Um, but there you have, I hope, a little sense of rum's origins and its popularity and its troublemaking in the pre-1800 period. And I thank you all for your patience through all of that. And um, I will attempt now to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you so much, Renee. That was very insightful. I- you want me to stop sharing this screen? Oh, yes. I mean, if you, if you, if you want to. Okay, I, I do have this. Again, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, these are just some of the 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 text that I referenced in it so but I'll stop sharing now and if people want to see those I can put them up again okay so uh I just want to say that I I had no idea the intricate history of rum and uh I don't think I'll ever look at a punch bowl the same way <laughs> after tonight um so we have a question uh from Jesse uh you mentioned that in this period the beer was more like porter uh, what about rum? Light, dark, golden? I would suspect dark. I tried to, I tried through some of the sources to find out things like what the alcoholic content would be of rum. And it's, it's very difficult to tell. There's not really any, any way to know. But given that um, they were not, like some later distillation techniques for rum used really kind of refined sugars. At this point, it's either the skimmings or it's molasses. And, and uh, they would be stored in wood barrels. My guess is it would have been fairly dark. That, that's just a guess, but my guess is it would have been very dark. Um, okay, so I have a question. <laughs> Since you are sort of, you know, a lot about rum and the rum, the history of rum, have you yourself tried the flip? I have not tried the flip. I've tried, not with the egg, that, that gets me. I Like, I can't, I can't bring myself to think it's a good idea to, to drink a raw egg. I don't know, I think if it had been, 
if I'd walked out to my barn and like picked it out from under a chicken that day, maybe I would do it. But I, I just not, I've had the like rum and screws beer and uh, like the, the Calabogus, but not, not with the egg. I, <laughs> I can't. And I don't know at the end of that video, I don't know if Townsend drinks it. I, I can't remember if at the end, I mean, he does things, he does crazy things in that YouTube channel. And I can't remember now if he actually if he actually drinks it, but he cracks the egg in it. The whole start of the video, he puts the eggs in. And I mean, it, it's just um, using eggs in cocktails, it's very common. It makes a major comeback at the end of the 19th century and in the 1920s and stuff. There's all kinds of cocktails that are made with eggs, but I can't bring myself to do it. I know. <laughs> someday, I maybe, someday, maybe after somebody's passed me one of those giant rumbles. <laughs> I will have the guts to try it. <laughs> At that point, no one knows what's in it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to double check that we have any more questions. I think we're we're good. Just checking Facebook. I think we're we're all good. So, oh, uh, Renee, thank you so much for this Very presentation. It was extremely enlightening. Um, uh, we have a we do have a thank you. From Suzanne. Suzanne said, great presentation, beautiful Thank imagery. Thank you, Suzanne. So uh, thank you so much again for joining us tonight. You're um, very welcome. I, I learned so much. So uh, thank you. Thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Anytime. You come back anytime. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. more about the pirate history. Yes, yes, next time. And gin, maybe. Perfect. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you again and have yourselves a lovely evening and I will see you next Thursday. Thanks, Sylvia. Bye-bye.